Welcome to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We are so excited to talk about what is perhaps the most universally loved meal on the planet, pizza. Everybody's got a favorite shop or maybe even a few favorite shops. And some of us ambitious home cooks even let the flour fly, crank up the heat on our ovens or grills, and make our own pizza at home. Later in the hour, we'll talk to Colin Kaplan, author of Pizza in New Haven. He is also one of the producers of the new documentary, Pizza, A Love Story. The film takes a deep dive into the history and families behind the three pizza shops that made New Haven famous for its pizza, Sally's, Pepe's, and Modern. But first, pizza at home. Plum, before we introduce our first pizza maker of the hour, if we're making pizza at home from scratch, what do we need to know? What's the simplest dough we can make? Five simple ingredients is all you need to make great pizza dough. Flour, water, yeast, salt, and a pinch of sugar, or honey, whichever one you prefer. The honey or the sugar is going to be used to wake that yeast up, or to bloom the yeast, as we call it. What you want to do is take some warm water in a bowl, add us a pinch of sugar, a little bit of honey. Now, some people don't do this, but this is how I do it. And then add your yeast to it. That yeast essentially has been asleep when you buy those little dry packets of yeast. you got to wake it up. And the best way to wake it up is with food. So what we do is I want to bloom it in that bowl of water. So add the yeast to the sugary water solution and watch as about 15 minutes go by, it'll start to foam up. That means the yeast is waking up and creating carbon dioxide, which is exactly what you want. Add your flour to it, a pinch of salt, mix it all up nicely, and then put a warm towel over it and stick it someplace to let it rest. You want it to double in size. Once it doubles in size, you can then take it back, cut it up into smaller portions, whatever you want. But what I like to do is after I the first proofing, I want to do a second proofing. So I actually will cut it up into the portions I want and then put it back aside for another 45 minutes or so. <laughs> I had an old adage that a chef told me a long time ago. He said, keep it simple, stupid. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Okay, so let's say we did buy dough at the market. Do we do anything differently? Yeah, and getting pizza dough from your local market is a great idea, but even better is to grab it from your local pizza shop. But the key thing is when you get that dough, make sure when you're rolling it out, you do it at room temperature. Don't let it be cold. Pull it out of the refrigerator. Let it warm up a little bit before you roll it. Pizza dough and cold aren't friends. Might be good to call in a pizza professional here. Back in August, we introduced you to Louise Joseph, owner of Dough Girls Pizza Truck based in Greenwich where Louise's specialty is scratch-made, wood-fired, personal pizzas. We thought it would be fun to catch back up with Louise to get some tips for making pizzas at home since her pizza kits have been such a big hit with customers. We asked Louise about her pizza roots and how she came up with Dough Girls. The name just kind of came to me. Um, I grew up in the West Haven, New Haven area. So clearly grew up on some great New Haven pizza, Sally's, Pepe's, Modern Bar, all the good stuff. I've always loved pizza, um, always cooking. Well, growing up where you grew up, mm -hmm. uh, in my brain, it's like iconic pizza world right there. I mean, it's the pizza mecca of the world. People may yell at me, be like, Italy, Italy, Italy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. New Haven. Your style of pizza that you make, is it more New Haven based, that thin crust, super hot oven, you know, or did you put your own spin on it? I did sort of put my own spin on it. I didn't want to do what New Haven was doing. I wasn't trying to mimic them. Uh, I was just trying to do my own thing. It's, I guess people compare it to Neapolitan, but technically it's not because it doesn't follow those rules. Because It's just delicious. I've had it. <laughs> I don't know what style or country or county or jurisdiction <laughs> it comes from. I just know it's really, really delicious. <laughs> yeah, I sent you home with some stuff, right? <laughs> like six pies, yes. <laughs> Typical New Haven style pizza is generally coal fired, but you use a wood fired grill oven, right? Yeah, wood fired oven. And um, I don't use Italian flour. Like, I don't use double zero flour. I get that a lot. People are like, oh, this is double zero, right? I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just isn't. You know, I, I just worked on a dough recipe for like three years. Not every day, but you I was going to say, my eyes recipe. just got the size of flying sauces. I was like, holy cow, <laughs> three years just on dough. Just on dough. Do you keep it pretty simple? Is it, I mean, I'm not giving away any secrets here, but flour, yeast, salt, you know, water, or do you change it up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, there's no sugar, there's no eggs, there's no oil in my dough. The ingredients are very basic. Try and keep it very, very simple, very pure. You know, I, I think it's interesting how people, if you don't make pizza dough on a regular basis, mm -hmm. realize how delicate and volatile it can be. If it's humid outside, your dough is going to be one way. If it's dry outside, it's going to be another oh, yeah. way. How the weather really does really affect your dough. It's, it's so hard, especially because I have a pizza truck. Like just yesterday, I was at Greenwich Polo, and it was hotter right. than it's been. 
So I'm like moving the dough closer to the oven. Wait, I'm just you know constantly watching it like a baby sleeping. You just gotta <laughs> just constantly watch it because you turn your head for one second and it's over. It's overproofed or you know just proof too much. And yeah, it gets um it gets interesting. It's alive. It's alive. Yes, yes, of course. Which begs the question for something that needs so much coddling and attention, like a baby, right? It's it's an mm-hmm. alive thing. At some point during the pandemic, you decided you needed to do something to sustain yourself and your food truck and your pizza truck. And -hmm. you started these at-home kits. So if you're sweating and you're the expert (laughs) over your pizza, how am I not going to lose my mind making a pizza at home? I give you instructions. <laughs> I mean, I'll have you. I'll have you on one call. I'll have you on one phone. I'll have Chef on the other phone. Time. I'll walk you through it. <laughs> you can absolutely make pizza at home. Louise and I talked about some equipment that might make it easier, like cookie sheets, which you already have, pizza stones, which you actually don't need, and she introduced me to the baking steel for diehard pizza makers and bakers. This sounds pretty intriguing. You know, I think one of the tricks I tell people if they don't have a pizza stone. You can actually take a couple of cookie sheets or sheet pans and put them in the oven just to keep that flat space there yeah. to put that on and let those pans heat up in the oven first so it's a hot surface the dough goes on top of. Right. That's what I say. I say just get a, a cookie sheet or a um, sheet pan and invert it because that way you don't have that lip to like try and get your right off of it. But uh, I was introduced to a life-changing piece of equipment, which is a baking steel. My friend Andres has... Um, invented and developed that go follow him on instagram baking steel 72 hour dough okay wait wait oh my god tell me the baking steel <laughs> oh no no I'm no look it up right oh. now what is this all right don't look it up now because you'll leave this interview and go get one so stay here it's <laughs> okay. amazing so it's basically this very heavy piece of steel i guess and you put it in the oven it's ideal if you do two because the radiant heat you cook on one and have one. So the radiant heat from the top cooks the top of the pizza and the bottom. And it comes out just like a wood-fired oven. Really? Yes. Mind blown. Amazing. So that's what I was playing with while I was developing the dough because I didn't want to, I had the truck already outfitted. I didn't want to spark up the oven yeah. every single time I wanted to test a little dough. And, and I had a, a pizza stone. That's holding my potted plants right now. Like I don't even use that. <laughs> like what is this thing? So, and I just leave the steel in my oven at all times. Just, it's always hot. You know, you crank your oven up to 500 degrees and make your pizza. That's great. Cause a lot of times you buy those pizza stones and after leaving them in the oven the whole time, it, they do eventually crack, which I've never quite understood why that happens, but it, yeah. you know, that's Cheap. terrible. So maybe this baking <laughs> yeah. steel is the way to go. Oh, it is definitely. Definitely. A thousand percent. I just want to kind of stick with the whole making pizzas at home still. Cause I think it's such an easy thing that you can have a lot of fun with, mm-hmm. with, you know, your kids or with, you know, family coming over. I mean, even if you don't want to use your oven, you can actually cook your pizza on the grill. Make sure that grill is nice and hot and put it on there. I actually take one side of the grill and get it smoking hot and leave the other side because we have two burners and leave it off. Yeah. So you have a little room to move it around. So grilling pizza is, is a great way to do it. I mean, do you do that ever at the house? Yeah, I do that quite often. Yeah, I do too. I use oil instead of flour to stretch the dough not a lot because then you get you know spark up some flames there but um yeah yeah, pizza at home i think it's pretty easy i'm saying that because i make it all day every day but you know you don't need tricks you don't need to toss it in the air there's nothing that's um i don't know that's so incredibly involved or difficult about it i think the most is people are afraid to make the dough and even that simple you can make a dough you can make pizza dough in a cuisinart you don't have to have a KitchenAid stand mixer. You don't have to knead it by hand for hours because you don't have any machinery to to make it, you know, kind of thing. So it's easier. And with the pandemic, you know, people were looking for, before everyone started baking bread, people were looking for things to do with their kids because their kids were bouncing off the wall. They couldn't go to, they didn't understand. They can't go to their friend's house. Their friends can't come over. It became a family event. I do not make my own pizza dough. I cheat. I make my own sauce, but... I will buy pizza dough from the grocery store. (laughs) And Plum has told me you can ask nicely at the pizzeria and they'll Mm -hmm. give you pizza dough if you're nice. For sure. But uh, it never comes out like the way you make it, like with those big yummy bubbles and the, 
you know, I think it came out, I, th- I think my dough came out looking like a pro, like with that yummy bubble and the char in just the right place, but it was by mistake. <laughs> how, do- <laughs> you how do you do yours deliberately? Come on. <laughs> I'm serious. How do you, how do you, am I stretching it out too much? Am I not stretching it out enough? Well, when you got the lovely char bubbles, I'm sure you did two things. I'm sure you brought it up to room temperature and waited before you stretched it. One, your oven was at the right temperature. All of those things. I'm, I'm shaking my head, even though I'm saying I'm agreeing with you. She's saying no. I think you did. You just don't remember. Oh, that's what it is. Right. Yeah. Like, I'm sure those are things like, I'm sure. Sure, maybe you took it out to let it get to room temperature. Is what you need to do because if you don't, it'll be like stretching a piece of paper. Right, you just can't do it. It's just gonna, it's not gonna happen. And then if you don't leave it long enough, you stretch it, it'll contract. You stretch it, it'll contract. You know, so you stretch it out to ten inches. You turn your head, you come back around. It's at five inches. So that's one thing is you need to let the dough come to room temperature before you stretch it. Now, how you stretch it? You can stretch it by hand. You can use a rolling pin if you stretch it. By hand, you get more bubbles. Oh. The rolling pin takes out the bubbles. It's smushing but them I tell out. people it, to use a rolling pin because it's a little bit more difficult to use by hand. Well, the rolling pin also too. You're going to be very. You're going to be way more um, uniform in your stretching of it using the rolling pin. Yeah. Plus, uh, think about it. It's like a, if those big trucks that they use on the roads and they pave roads that have the big spinning wheel on it. It makes everything flat. Same thing happens to your dough. It pushes out all the air bubbles there. Try to do right. it by hand. It's listen. It's pizza. It's fun. It doesn't have to be perfectly round. You know, no, you can make different happen. shapes out of it. I mean, oh yeah, no, I don't try to make it round or square. Yeah. It's always an amoeba. What temperature <laughs> should the oven be though? Five hundred. I'd agree with that. Five hundred, not four seventy-five, huh? I know. A lot of people are afraid to put their ovens at 500. I was too, you know, when I started experimenting. I'm like, well, they they make this oven so it can go to five. They wouldn't put it at 500 if it wasn't supposed to go to 500. <laughs> it's not going to hurt it. Yes. <laughs> uh, Louise, what temperature do you have for the oven on the truck? 800. Yeah, 800. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. I'm not really this dark. Well, <laughs> this is a tan from the oven. <laughs> from the oven. <laughs> From the oven. <laughs> I will say it's nice to see your face. The last time you and I saw each other, we were both in our masks. Oh, yeah, that's right. And now right. I can yeah. see you. So uh, I have a pizza oven here at my house, Louise, that I, it's mm-hmm. one of my favorite things, my favorite toys that I have. And I cook yeah. around, you know, I found that for me personally, being between that 550 to 750, depending on how thick the pizzas are and stuff like that, that's what I'm making. But 500 degrees for your oven at home works great. I think using, yeah. you know, if you can get it up there a little bit higher, just know that Basically, it's going to take a little bit longer if that oven temperature or that heat is lower. It's going to take a little bit longer to cook. Right. And you may not, to to get that nice crispiness on the outside. Yeah. And if you use a baking steel or even a sheet pan or whatever, let that pan sit in the oven for at least an hour. Yeah. Get nice and hot. At least an hour. I was doing that. All right. I get one check mark. Uh, Mm -hmm. What about cheese? I know you make your own cheese. Ain't yes. nobody at home got time for that. <laughs> I am buying two for five shredded mozzarella at ShopRite. <laughs> am, is that wrong? Am, are, the, no. are the pizza gods uh, going to curse me? No, you can use whatever cheese you want. You don't even have to use mozzarella. You can use whatever. Like some people like to use cheddar. Blasphemy. Or, like a light cheddar. Provolone. Yeah. That feels wrong. Cheddar on a pizza? This is, this is not right. <laughs> we can't be doing that. I don't like that. I mean, I'll yeah. do a little bit of parmigiano. <laughs> Font- Fontina, I'm in. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Parmesan, I'm in. I don't like pineapple on pizza. No. I'm sorry. I know that will probably upset people. It doesn't upset me. I'm right there with you. Okay, There's two things you. that will not go on my pizza. And I have nothing against people who, who do. One is pineapple and one is ranch dressing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. People put ranch dressing on their pizza? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. What do you not want on your pizza, Plum? Uh, I don't think fruit should ever be on pizza. I get that it tastes good, but no thanks. Now, I may take that fruit and put it into a sauce and make a pineapple tomato sauce if I'm making a pizza with bacon or a pork belly or something like that. But, you know, that's really stretching the boundaries for me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's pizza. There is no boundaries. You do whatever you want with it. I mean, you think about how this stuff was made originally. You know, I mean, it, it was it was scraps of food thrown on bread. Like, it's it, you, there's no right or wrong. It's just personal preference. What about what about figs? I have done figs on pizza. Figs with gorgonzola. I've done that. It's fruit. It's fruit. Yes, it is. <laughs> Can't do it. I'll put them on the side. How about yeah. that? We'll make a salad. Oh. That's what we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, you know what? I also don't like the salad pizza. If you're going to have a salad, have a salad. If you're going to have pizza, pizza. I did like your arugula. What was it? Arugula, prosciutto? Yeah, because, because you have to do the salad after the pizza comes out of the oven. And I have to explain that to a lot of people because they think they see salad pizza and they think they're going to get wilted lettuce that's been in an 800 degree oven. I was like, no, you know, I make the pizza, they pull it out, then I make a salad and put it on top. Let's talk sauce for a second, Louise. I was I was just thinking in my brain here, coming from uh, New Haven, and mm-hmm. and you know you figure the typical tomato pie in New Haven actually isn't sauce at all. It's just you know tomatoes, you know, or right. canned tomatoes or something like that. For you, what does a sauce mean? How do you make it? What do you like to have in it? What do you like to see in a sauce? I'll tell you what I don't like to see in a sauce is sugar. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. A lot of people feel that they need to take the sort of, I don't want to say bitter, but sometimes some tomatoes have a little edge to them and they want to take that edge away by adding sugar. But I don't add sugar to my sauce. Um, I don't add uh, olive oil to my sauce. I keep it very simple, very basic. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. I, my general pizza sauce, if I make it, is going to be good tomatoes, San Marziano yeah. is what I like to use. Uh, I'll put a little uh, fresh garlic in there and then maybe a pinch of oregano. But I do like to, use, and, and obviously I'm going to season it with salt, but I like to use a little olive oil in there too, but I don't cook it. Yeah, I don't cook mine either. Ladle it on the, onto the dough and let it cook that yeah. way. Mm-hmm. Because that oven's so hot, you know what I mean? Like to cook it and then cook it again at 800 degrees, even, in, even though it's in there for like two minutes, a minute and a half. It cooks it. Uh, I feel it just takes the, yeah, it takes the, just takes something away from the flavor of the sauce like that if you do it like that. So, so we got to get a baking steel is what we got to get or a sheet pan in the oven. Got to have that. Have the oven nice and hot. Let's make sure we get that sheet pan nice and hot, right? Keep your dough simple. If you don't feel comfortable making it, you can go pick one up from your local pizza guy that you do like. I'm sure they'll sell you a dough or go see Louise. I'm sure she'd set you up with a dough if you need it. And no fruit. We are the anti fruit. No fruit on the pizza. Anti-fruit. Before we go, which is your favorite pizza spot in New Haven? Sally's. Sally's. Sally's it is. No question. Sally's it is. (laughs) Hands down. You're the best, Louise. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone. Bye. That was Louise Joseph, owner of Dough Girls Pizza Truck, currently slinging scratch-made wood fire pizza parked at the Greenwich YMCA, the Greenwich Polo Club, and the old Greenwich Farmer's Market. And after the break, Colin Kaplan, author of Pizza in New Haven and a producer of the new documentary, Pizza, a Love Story. He dishes with us about Sally's Peppies and Modern, the holy trinity of New Haven pizza. I don't tell anybody that their taste buds are wrong. I just say I feel sorry for them (laughs) if they didn't grow up in New Haven. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. This is Seasoned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Our next guest is Colin Kaplan, one of the producers of the new documentary, Pizza, A Love Story. Here's a taste of what this fun movie is all about. Anyone who would ever use the phrase, it's just pizza, they're beyond hope. I would just silently say to myself, it's your loss. It's your loss. Just get away from me. If you haven't been to New Haven and had Pepe's, Sally's, and Modern, you really can't talk about pizza with any authority. It was never called pizza. We're going for our beats. Here we are, Polish people. We're going for our beats. A beats. A beats. A beats. A beats. A beats. Six or seven years that we've been doing this list, there's only one year that Pepe has not been number one on that list. I think a Sally's love is a really cultist. We were members of the Sally's religion, and I think what made it special, of course, was the quality of the pot. Everybody in New Haven kind of has to pick a side. I like that modern is a little bit more user-friendly for me as a New York, New Jersey guy. It's always Sally's. Modern. I'm a Pepe guy. Oh, Sally's. Modern I beats. Pepe's beats. By far Sally's. Modern. Yay! Pepe's. I would say it is the pizza capital of the United States. Yeah, I mean, Chicago pizza is not pizza. What we do is pizza. What we do is, you know, is horizontal. Look at 
get that pie. But I believe that pizza is a connective tissue. It's something that makes us happy. It feeds us. It connects different people together. It's the one of the only shared foods by its very nature. I feel extremely fortunate to have the best pizza in the world right here at our fingertips. Sally's peppies are modern. Yes. <laughs> you just heard the voices of Lyle Lovett, Henry Winkler, or as I like to call him, the Fonz, Amy Kundrak, Senator Chris Murphy, among many New Haven locals, writers, historians, and pizza connoisseurs fervent in their love for Sally's, Pepe's, or Modern. Thank you for joining us, Colin. My pleasure. Is, can we ask you what your favorite one is or no? Uh, you know, you can ask me and I'll tell you this. Out of those three, if I had one of those on any given day, Sally's Peppies or Modern, in that order, I would be the happiest man alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good day right there. <laughs> very, very diplomatic. I just want to put this out there in full disclosure, because this could determine the way the rest of this conversation goes. Uh-oh. I've never been to Sally's. Oh, wow. <gasps> what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> Marisol, really? Really? Well, I'm a native oh. New Yorker. So, okay. you know, I've lived in the Nutmeg State for 15 years. I guess I've been saving it until this happened, until this. Well, we got to get you down to New Haven because it's New Haven style pizza. And one of the things that people couldn't see in that trailer, Colin, that we just played are the seven things that make New Haven pizza what it is. Let's dig into it. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, I'll do my best. You got to have an amazing base. That's your crust, your sauce. And of course, one of the lessons in the movie is it's moots. It's not mozzarella you know so it's all these ways mozzarella. You, yeah i mean it's how you speak it so if you go to a restaurant you don't know how to order you're in trouble so you get a plain pizza that's with just sauce on it you know it's not with the moots on it there's all these little lessons even the way you say pizza a beats a beats exactly right? it's a beats. beats and that's it and it's an old language from a very old tradition that we've been carrying on for 150 years in new haven so what makes New Haven style pizza uniquely New Haven? I usually describe the pizza as, and no one knows this term except for the pizza fanatics, but neo-Neapolitan style, which means specifically to New Haven, it's thin crust, it's very crispy and chewy, and it's charred, not burnt, but charred <laughs> uh, with, a, with a layer. I like that disclaimer. Yeah. And then on top is a layer of crushed tomato. That's cooked with the pie in brick ovens. Traditionally, these would have been a coal-fired oven. There's different variations in New Haven style, but that's the tradition. Anything else on top of that is is extra. You know, that's why you pay more for mozzarella. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like the flame licked pizza, right? It's it's gently kissed by the fire. That's all. Absolutely. That, that's a, that's what the char marks mean. Yeah, actually, right? Lyle Lovett says it the best. They're like all the parts are like playing off each other, like they're like in some sort of passionate romance with each other and. The best pizzas should really taste like one thing working together. I just think it's amazing you have a movie made that you have Lyle Levitt talking about pizza. I mean, that's like, check that off the bucket list of things to do in life. You know, what's interesting is we have small cities in Connecticut, but all of our little areas of Connecticut have arenas and places where musicians have been able to perform and will again be able to perform. Yeah. These guys, when they come to New Haven, they all get a pizza. They get Sally's, they get Peppy's, they get Modern, and that's how they know New Haven. They literally look forward to playing in New Haven because of our of our beats. Is New Haven, is it safe to say, I mean, just we're not being homers here, is the pizza capital of the world? Can we say that? Yeah, I <laughs> mean, <laughs> and Barstool Sports says it. We've heard it from many other people that New Haven is really the, uh, the best community for pizza in America. And, you know, growing up here, I can say it. And most of us Connecticut people will, will point our fingers and say, oh, New Haven, that's where it's at. How did New Haven become the pizza capital of the world? We were an industrial city. We were also an influx of so many immigrants, and we still are. We're an immigrant city. And being that welcoming, we welcomed more Italians than any other city per capita. So now our metro region has the most Italians of any metro region in the whole country. And most of them came from where pizza was made, which was the southern part called Campania. One of the reasons I love doing this show so much is because food is so steeped in culture and it has a story because it all originates from somewhere. How did you fall in love with pizza? I'm guessing it's because my parents took me to all the best pizza places when I was just a baby. I'm also going to guess that my first solid food was most likely a beets. A beets? <laughs> yeah, it was like, I probably, it was my first word, perhaps, you know. 
it's the only way I actually learned that it was different anywhere else was traveling. I went to school in New Orleans. Great food, not great pizza. I would agree. Yeah, I lived in Florida. I lived in Maine and L.A. And, you know, great food, not the greatest pizza. Well, I'm not going to go to New Haven for a po' boy, so they shouldn't, we shouldn't <laughs> go to, to, to New Orleans for a pizza. I keep looking for, the, for my catfish po' boy <laughs> place, but it keeps closing <laughs> on me. Cajun places, man. We need more of them. <laughs> That's funny, man. Yeah. So we talked a little bit ago about the big three, Sally's, Modern, and Pepe's. The pizzas are delicious. They're all kind of similar, but they're kind of different. What do you think is the best way to describe how each one's different from each other? Some of the biggest differences in these pizzas that are, you might say are so closely related in style are really the, the basis of tradition of each family, uh, how they make the pizza. It's also the actual ingredients they're picking. So from anything from the flour to the yeast type to uh, the, the sauce brand, which is really just crushed tomatoes, the cheese type, and then it's their ovens. It's, um, you know, what kind of fuel are they using? What kind of oven? And what temperature? How long do they cook it? How long do they proof the dough? All these things end up making a huge difference in what you get on your plate or on your tray in New Haven. You're not getting a slice. Like in New York City, you order a slice. In New Haven, right. you're getting the whole thing. You're getting the That's whole right. tray yep. and hopefully we're, eating the whole thing. Yeah, we're very opinionated people here in New Haven, and we only serve a full pie. You better be ready for it. It's like you can <laughs> eat the whole thing. So, you know, in some of the very traditional pizza spots in New York City, they only serve pies. That's actually an old school tradition coming out of Italy, coming out of the old pizzerias. New Haven kept that old school tradition. It's hard to go to a, a, any place in New Haven that's a traditional a beats shop and actually try to get a slice. It's really, really rare. It's been changed because of the kind of culture that, you know, now pizza is American for the last 60 years. It's part of our culture of getting things on the go. So part of the understanding each culture in each region is understanding how people live in, in those traditions. When you decided to make the book Pizza in New Haven... Um, and then the documentary, where did you start? Because it seems so ever encompassing. Like I'm, I'm trying to like gather it all in. Where did you start? How did you know you wanted to do this? And how did you know you were done when you were done? Yeah, done. <laughs> <laughs> you were tired. You, you were know, like, I've had enough. <laughs> you know what the hardest part is, is once you finish something like this, you keep finding more things to add in. So we'll never be done, but it is done. The DVD is finally released. It's out there. You can get it as a digital copy. You can rent it, buy it. You can have your own solid version. The book is out there. So these things are, are ways that we can now teach and we feel good about it. The movie started with two guys, Gorman Bichard and Dean Falcone, loved pizza, loved music, and wanted to put some you know rock star type documentary together about their favorite food. And it took them 11 years to do it. When they started, I was living in Los Angeles, learning how to be a food tour guide, doing crazy things. I, I was on a Jerry Springer show out there. I mean, excuse you, are you the father or no? I, you know what? It was a Bachelorette show, and I lost. <laughs> <laughs> I was sent home. You're probably better off. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so I was I was missing pizza so badly that I was literally looking up every day how I could learn more about pizza from home, and that's how I found. The movie being made, they had a, a Kickstarter campaign, and I really started focusing on my education of food at that point, rather than just history and rather than just, you know, locale. I was very interested in the history of food and people. I don't know about you, Plum, but whenever I meet someone and that human says, yeah, I don't like pizza, I, I almost feel like I can't talk to them anymore. It's this strange, I just walk away. It's a very visceral <laughs> feeling. Like, I do yeah. feel like it's very much a universal food. There are people who perhaps they're lactose intolerant, maybe, so they can't have the dairy, or they don't like bread. I mean, what's or they, they maybe there's a gluten allergy. Yeah. I don't know. There are now gluten free pizzas. True. There are gluten free pizzas. There's vegan pizzas. There's pizza made of cauliflower. There's pizza from all over the world made of all different things. Original pizzas were made of dates and 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 all sorts of almond pastes as their dough. I mean, we've really been dealing with a very new type of food that's a bread product. You know, it's a simple bread product, but it can always be changed. The question is, is that going to taste good? <laughs> right. <laughs> chef Plum and, and Marisol, you must know, I mean, a good chef can make anything palatable. Sure. But I, will it enter my dreams? Will it be my last meal? I don't know. 
We'll see. For me, when I take a bite of a white clam pie at Pepe's, all I do is think about it for the next week and want to go get another one. Number one rated in the country every year. There's a reason why. Yeah, absolutely. Colin, do you have a favorite pie? I sure do. And it is? So it's it's a plain pizza. It's a New Haven plain. It's a, a simple pie. It's literally your red sauce. I like garlic on it. You got a little grated Pecorino Romano on that. Cook it to a nice crisp, a char, coal-fired oven. That's a simple pizza. That's the way it was originally served, and that's the way I like it. One of the things I found the most interesting when learning about New Haven pizza, it's not always a sauce. It's sometimes just good canned tomatoes that are put on there, sometimes a little bit of oregano, you know, but no olive oil, things like that mixed in. Just very, very simple, right? Yeah. I mean, I think using the word sauce differentiates it from, say, like a fresh tomato okay. on your pizza. But yes, it is actually, in fact, crushed and ground tomatoes that are spread on top of a pizza raw and then cooked on the pizza in the oven. That is a very traditional way of cooking what we call tomato pie. It's the translation of abits. Yeah. Later on, there were definitely more variations where people started putting fresh tomato on, and they started making, you know, there was actually the original pizzas were white pies, which have what we call no sauce, but in fact, those are the original pizzas. Pizzas were brought into the Western world in the 1500s, excuse me, uh, tomatoes, and that sort of translates to the fact that there was never even uh, a red pie. So so a, a white pie was no sauce. No I sauce. I think of a white pie as having like some sort of ricotta cheese or something. Right? It could have a it could have ricotta cheese, as we say here. We go ricotta. <laughs> I turn every, just so you know, when I can't, this good little Puerto Rican from the Bronx, whenever I can't translate something or pronounce something, I immediately default to Spanish. So I just went <laughs> ricotta. But if it's, if it's ricotta, I'll call it ricotta. When I was in Italy, that's how I survived. I used Spanish to actually get through, and they understood me generally. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So it, in essence, I mean, a white pie is really just a, a pie with olive oil and, and cheese and maybe meats and other vegetables on it. And that is the, the very, very traditional original way pizzas were probably formed, and well before tomatoes came into the picture. You know, there's no right or wrong here. I know uh, Colin, being a guy from New Haven, he might say, no, no, that's the wrong way to make it. But, no. you know, when it comes to pizza, it should be fun. It should be delicious. And there's no rules. And kind of remember that when you're doing it. There's no rules to making pizza. Well, so there are some rules to different people, right? So, cu- here, so this is what I was going Well, for. here we go. <laughs> so here's the deal. If you're Pepe's family. That was a trigger moment that I had with you. That's oh, I was my God. For. I felt it. <laughs> if you're Pepe's family. And your your son or daughter is going to marry into a Sally's family. Oh, my God. Is this like the Montagues and the Capulets? And the Capulets, yeah. This is worse. <laughs> it's worse. This is worse. This is like, we're not talking to you. We can't even eat together. So oh, there are major rivalries between the families that have been served by these different pizzerias. So modern has its own traditional family. They go there. They're modern people. I mean, they're very passionate. They're like, no, we don't go down to Worcester Street. And then you've got your Sally's people who are like, we used to go here when they opened. Sally was our friend, you know, and they don't they're like Pepe's. That's not pizza. They'll even say that. And then you have your Pepe's aficionados who who will say we're the best. You can see it. You know, we don't mind waiting in line or we don't have to wait in line because we know them. Customers pick their favorite and they're so passionate about it. You can ask anybody, generally speaking, in Connecticut what their favorite pizza is and they will hands down have one and then they will fight you about it. I <laughs> know. Uh, I believe that. I believe a fight That's will true. ensue. But what is the delineation between the three is there one well yeah i mean other than the obvious that they're three different families yeah well they aren't necessarily three different families that's the funny part yeah i'm a genealogist too i do too many things and is that right I, I, I i'm did. also the pa announcer for the mets we all have side hustles <laughs> yeah i was a pro wrestler i love it <laughs> so uh the whole thing is when you go back you realize that there was you know a certain amount of people that came over and a lot of these guys were families and taught each other so frank Pepe was Salvatore or Sally Consiglio's uncle. And Sally yes. originally worked at Pepe's when he was a kid. There is like all this, you know, intermingling. Well, especially when you talk about the pizza makers who go from one pizza place to the next. Yeah. I know that the second owner of Modern worked at Pepe's before he went to Modern and was taught by the guy who ran Modern in 1942 or so. So do you have four or different owners that own Modern Abits? But... The family today has kept one thing there. That lineage was actually the the yeast, the kind of sourdough starter. Oh, my God. And people who've had modern in the 30s told me that it tastes the same. Really? And you can ask so many different people the same question. They will tell you, oh, it's the same. No, it's not the same. 
why is New Haven pizza so good? Is it the water? Yes, it is. No, it's not. How about that? It's <laughs> very confusing. And very fun. <laughs> pizza makers have gone from one pizza establishment to the other and live to tell the day. It's not like... Oh, the pizza places all get along, generally speaking. I mean, any pizza place of clout has no problem with another pizza place. They, they are not in competition. They are all there helping each other. They borrow things from each other. They see how they're doing. They're literally building a New Haven business tradition. They're building a legacy. It's not just one place. If it was one place, we would have nothing to talk about. They're also the very definition of what other parts of the country know as New Haven style pizza, right? So this little section of Connecticut has created a language for the rest of the country, right? Because in Chicago, they've got deep dish pizza and we have New Haven style pizza. So that is quite a legacy. It's a huge legacy. Every place in the country has their own style pizza. Detroit has a style of pizza, like California style pizza. How many different types can there possibly be, Colin? We're figuring that out now because the question is, if you really break it down, it's kind of like the animal kingdom. It's like you have different phylum and orders and all these different things that go down. So there's thick and there's thin. That's really two ways of describing pizza in my book. And right. you've got a bunch of pizzas that are thick and you've got a bunch of pizzas that are thin. Where does New Haven fall? It's in the thin. And then you could go down from there and break down each city. You know, a place like New York City, there's five different kinds of pizzas they make. So when someone says, I grew up on New York pizza, I'm always like thick or thin. It's like what you grew up with is what you call pizza. So I don't tell anybody that their taste buds are wrong. I just say I feel sorry for them if they <laughs> didn't grow up in New Haven. <laughs> we all know about, obviously, the big three. But talk about some other great local recommendations, some great spots that people haven't heard of and they should go check out. As a pizza historian and a purist, I stick with what I know best. And that's going with the old school ones that do things the way that we grew up with. So the next one I'd go to would be, say, Ernie's. Ernie's goes back to 1971. They've been making pizza the same way ever since. Uh, Ernie's son, Pat, runs it for the last 30 years. One guy makes the pizza. When he goes on vacation, the place is closed. It's like that. Literally a, a mom and pop type place. It's in Westfield section of New Haven. Another one is Zupardi's Abitz. Old school. Goes back to the 30s. The guy, Domenico Zupardi, came from the same town as Pepe did. They make an amazing pizza. The, the family is it's now third, fourth generation run. Wow. And they wow. have the hops company where they make pizza. They have a pizza truck. They sell their frozen pizza around the country. They, they actually have their pizza in supermarkets around the country. Which so, one is this? This is Zupardi's Abitz in West Haven. Amazing family, amazing business, and an amazing pizza. Another one is is uh, Mike's Abitz in West Haven, a little known cousin of Ernie's that goes back to the 1940s in Savin Rock in West Haven, and they make a really good pizza in like a little dive bar setting, very cute. Roseland, Roseland Abitz in Derby, wonderful Italian restaurant run by the same family, you know, third generation run since the 30s, and they're making amazing pizza. Generally speaking, in a 10-mile radius around New Haven, there are some really good pizzerias that are doing what I would call top-notch abits. This is my new best friend, Colin. I could talk to you all day long about pizza. Yeah, thanks, guys. It was really fun. Cheers. That was Colin Kaplan. Colin is the author of the book Pizza in New Haven and producer of the new documentary Pizza, A Love Story. The film is available on DVD, and you can watch it on Amazon Prime. Check out the movie's Facebook page for screenings. Colin is also the co-owner of Elm City Party Bike and the culinary tour guide for Taste of New Haven. He's definitely a good friend to have if you want to know where to eat in New Haven. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to hear from several neighborhood pizza makers from around the state. You're listening to Season. Stay with us. Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. It's time to shine a light on a few shops and hardworking pizza makers outside of New Haven. And we'll share some of your recommendations from Instagram, too. We'll start in Cheshire with the quintessential neighborhood pizza joint and maker. Yeah, my name's uh, Peter Bishop. I am the owner. I'm the head chef. I'm the head dishwasher. I'm pretty much everything at Pop's Pizza in Cheshire. I've been doing it now going on uh, our 35th year, and uh, it's been fantastic. Back in 1986, I had just finished uh, my basketball career. I'd come to an end. Um, I was kind of not really sure what I wanted to do next. And the, the building that I'm in now, my grandfather actually owned. 
And uh, I was actually in the car getting ready to go to California, uh, moved to California. And he says to me, he goes, hey, Pete, you know, come on, stay around. We don't want you to leave. We like having you around. He goes, let's open a pizza place. His name was Pop. I said, uh, Pop, you know, only thing I know how to do is eat pizza. I have no idea how to make a pizza. And he said, ah, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. First year was pretty shaky. You know, we, uh, we didn't quite know what we were doing, but I think that goes back about the community at the time, you know, I was just came back from playing professional basketball. I was well known, you know, the whole town kind of embraced me playing basketball. So we kind of took the same, the same feelings and turned it into my pizza place. And, you know, luckily, like in anything, if you kind of learn from your mistakes, you can do people right. And I think people gave me a second chance after not really knowing what I was doing. And from there, it just it went on from there. Pete said about 12 years in, he hit his stride by focusing on kids in the community and serving up simple quality pie at an affordable price. Get the kids in early so they become Pops fans when they're five. So when their parents say, hey, you know, where do you want to go for pizza? They'll say, hey, I want to go to Pops. And so that's what we really tried to base our beginning off was being with the kids, throwing birthday parties, sponsoring teams. And, you know, our, our basic concept was always pretty simple. It's just be affordable to the family and let's just do volume of pizza. And, you know, we kept our prices low. Just try to make it simple for families so dinner isn't a big ordeal. And it worked. After 35 years flipping pizzas, it's the fun, special requests and everyday moments with customers that Pete really appreciates. Like a lot of times during the prom season, the kids will call up and say, hey, can you write, you know, will you go to prom with me with pepperoni? Last September, a couple got married and their big thing was they wanted these certain grinders that we made. It was really sweet and it was really kind of fun. And, you know, so many great people that have passed through as employees, so many great customers. Um, this one guy who comes in, this guy, Scott, and he was, I remember when he was a little, little guy and he always got the old fashioned pizza. And still now, all these years later, he's got to be, you know, in his 40s and he still comes in like, you know, every now and then he goes, you know what I want? Two slices of old fashioned on a plate. <laughs> so those kind of things are just everyday things that happen that are, you know, that are special. You know, you just build that bond with the community. You build the bond with customers. It makes for, it makes for good pizza. Everybody has a favorite neighborhood pizza joint. And you shared your favorites with us on our Instagram page. Hoosier on the Move recommends the breakfast pizza at Illicit Brewing in Manchester. I agree. That's a great spot. And Mel underscore Eve says Brick Oven on Main, acronym BOOM, B-O-O-M, in Bridgeport has the best pie in the city. Now, Jeff Browning may have something to say about that. He's a partner at Brewport Brewing Company in Bridgeport, where Connecticut beers are on tap and the pizza and salads are top notch. I am uh, what I'd like to believe is somewhat of a pizza connoisseur. And, uh, you know, pizza and beer, that's the common man's food, right? You guys are a brewery as well as an awesome pizza place. Yeah. I mean, my background is as a commercial brewer. As I just mentioned, I love pizza. So what we decided to do is very simply open a pizza restaurant that focused on pizza, salad, and beer. And we're New Haven style pizza, which is thin crust pizza. All of our ingredients are locally sourced. They come to us every other day. Uh, Absolutely fresh. You may remember me talking to you about the pepperoni. What we end up with is a pepperoni that comes straight from Italy that we hand cut ourselves. And that's the attention to detail that separates us from other pizza places. We blend our own cheese. The fact that we make our own sauce, handpick everything. Even our clams are fresh every other day. These are all the things that make great pizza. I've always thought, keep it simple. You don't have to overthink it. Just use great ingredients and make great food. Well, pizza is a simple food, but that doesn't mean that you don't take the time to literally pay attention to every detail. We raise our dough and that every dough is made two or three days in advance and you get that extra rise. That gives us the ability to have the elasticity in the dough to roll it out thin and not make it a cracker. Cooking in an oven that's 650 degrees, you better know what you're doing with your dough. So, Jeff, talk about one or two simple beer pairings for someone who's having pizza. You know, uh, very good question. I always get asked, what's my favorite beer? And my response is always the beer in front of me. And then people roll their yeah. <laughs> And they're like, what's your second favorite beer? And I said, the next beer that's going to be in front of me. <laughs> you know, the great thing about beer is that it actually pairs much better with certain foods than wine does. And there is a much broader variety of those beers. We currently have a beer on tap called They Call Me Coach, 
which is a kettle sour. We call it a Greek sour because we use honey, malt, and lemon. Now, imagine that light, subtle citrus flavor going with, say, our arugula and chicken cutlet pizza that we do from time to time. Again, we mentioned the clam pie. You wouldn't know New Haven pizza if you didn't understand fresh clam pie. And a fresh clam pie, you want to go like a subtle pale ale. Something that's got just enough hot bitterness that it's going to cleanse your palate and allow you to eat each individual slice as if it's the first time you're putting it in your mouth. If you haven't been down there, go to Bridgeport, check out Brewport. Great beers, great pizzas, great salads, and great owners. Jeff, we appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to you coming down and making some pies with us soon. You know, I hit up CT Public's Instagram with a shout-out to Fortina Pizza in Stamford. Talk about gorgeous pizza. And on my Instagram, I saw recommendations for Casanova in Shelton. Daniel Joseph calls the buffalo chicken pizza from Luna bangin'. And there was a shout-out for Naughty Dolphin Pizza, which is actually inside the Fairfield train station. Give it up for train station pizza. Now, let's hear from the women who run a tiny Italian restaurant that's a big favorite of mine. Lorenzo's Restaurant in Sandy Hook is about to mark their 95th year serving what I consider to be one of the best pizzas in town. Owner Lori McCollum and her daughter Mariah Tanny run this tiny little spot. It originally started as a snack hut by Lori's grandfather in 1926. You know, when restaurants have been around for this long, I'm always curious about what's changed and what stays the same over time. Has any of the recipes for the dough and the sausage, has that stuff changed over the years? No, not at all. The exact same? Mm Mm-hmm. Do you guys actually have a recipe book written for it or no? We have like an old typewriter. It looks like it's on like coffee colored paper, <laughs> like taped together. <laughs> but it says like a pinch of this, an eyeball of this, yeah. a finger length of this. So <laughs> we don't really know who's. It sounds like you've got a recipe for me. Because that's exactly <laughs> yeah. what I would say. I don't know. Put this yeah. in there. You so we, I don't want to say eyeball it, but a lot of things we go off of what we think, you know, based on history, but. You're a staple. Everyone knows Lorenzo's Pizza. That's that's the way to go. But to last 95 years, you know, with no major commercial push or anything like that, is it just the local sustaining the restaurant, or what's it, how's it been? I think especially over the past two years, it's kind of been a split between completely new people that have the same story. I've lived here my whole life. I never heard of it. Right. Someone told me in the grocery store. Or someone told me wherever. Or people that have been coming here generation after generation after generation. Most of it's just been word of mouth. Right. I think we kind of liked the whole staying off of the media and just kind of doing it by ourselves and letting people come down and really get the experience right. for themselves. Owner Lori has been making the pizzas for more than 50 years. Mariah could have any number of specialty pizzas on the menu, but her favorite? I'm um, just cheese. Just I do cheese. cheese all the way. Although I just started recently doing a white crust with just mozzarella, a little bit of garlic, and then throwing a Caesar salad on top of that. Okay. Because the crust kind of acts as like a crouton. Uh huh. Right, and Lori, I got to ask, pizza for you. What is what's the most important part about the pizza for you as the someone dough. who's making pizza? The dough. The dough is. I've been making it most of my whole life, and it is the by far the hardest thing to do. If it's humid out, it's gonna come out weird. If it's cold out, it's gonna come out weird. Pizza dough is very picky. Yeah. Now, do you keep it simple? Just water, flour, yeast, salt. Do you really, you really think I'm gonna say that? Wow. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going there. I love how Lori wouldn't give away any of the family recipes. We have a feeling, and it's just a guess, that pretty much everyone hearing this episode right now is calling in an order for pizza tonight. And we don't blame you. Support your local pizzerias. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Seasoned is produced by Robin Doyanakin and Katie Talarski. Thanks for listening.